My name Sa is... Stand up and oh. introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Nathan Emmons. I'm a student here and I'm studying these sorts of issues. I'm a PPE major, philosophy, politics, and economics. It seems like all of you guys are sort of talking about all these different problems and when I, I'm thinking about it sort of from a perspective of why is the politician choosing to make these decisions? It seems to have to do with their incentives, that they're being incentivized to pander to their base. You know, that's where the money comes from. That's where the people coming out to support them. That's where all that's coming from. So how could that, it seems like that has to be changed in order for politicians to you know, be doing that. So how do you change those incentives to make those sorts of changes? How do you change the incentives so politicians don't pander to the base? Well, Who would like to take that? Well, Ed? First of all, you do need some significant form of campaign reform. If you don't have it, there's going to be pandering to the base, pandering to the special interest. But secondly, forget about money. I mean, we all rightly emphasize money, but not, money doesn't win elections. If money was the sole determinant of winning elections, Romney would have wrapped this up and Meg Whitman would be the governor of California. Yeah. Money doesn't decide elections in and of itself. There's one thing more important than money and it's votes. And in high profile elections, even if you don't have money, and Rick Santorum has proved it, if your message is one that people want to hear, you can win. And I think if I were running for president today, and as I say often, I have no intention of spending two and a half years of my remaining life in, West, in, in um, New Hampshire and Iowa. But if I were running for president today, I would run just like I said. I would tell people the truth. You're going to hate my answer to our nation's problems, but when you reflect upon it, you're going to realize it's the only way out. That's the way you disincentivize the things that are driving and, the problem. And by the way, that is precisely what Edmund Burke said about how he would stand up to, he would tell his constituents when he disagreed with them. And he said, all government is a form of compromise and barter. But he also said, I'm going to stand up for what I believe in front of my constituents. He said he owed his constituents his judgment. Exactly. Right. And he absolutely, exactly. that's a, mm -hmm. Great quote. something that is forgotten. That's right. And he wedded that with believing that government was compromised. You give your judgment and then you make policy. That's the only way you can move forward. OK. I see a question and, and there. Just one quick thing. And you're right, you do exactly that, but you have to know there's a chapter in my book, 2699. It's a, <laughs> a chapter in my book which is called Know When to Hold Them, Know When to Fold Them. them. There are some things you have to draw the line in the sand about, but there are others that you have know to. Know when to walk yeah. away, know when to run. That's yeah. Right. <laughs> That's right. And Olympia Snow is just running now, yeah. so no. Uh, go ahead. Is that uh, Bonnie? No, it's Terry Gillen. Okay. Hi. I haven't heard anybody talk about redistricting, and I wonder if people think that polarized congressional districts have contributed to the problem. Charles? I knew I was going to get this question. Oh, poor Charles. Uh, <laughs> we talked, we talked about, about this. this. Yeah. Uh, well, what, 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 what you're seeing is that there are fewer and fewer contested districts out there. So mm -hmm. basically, as the governor mentioned before, a lot of people now, the primary becomes the election. And that makes it much more polarized. So you have to, if you're in a Republican district, you have to go way to the right to beat the other guy because that is how you actually win the race. And to that, in, to that degree, I think that it does contribute to part of the polarization. And I don't know how you get out of that because that only happens, the redrawing only happens every 10 years. So you have it now, we don't have it again for you know, 10 more years, so we're stuck with it. Over here, John. Hi, uh, my name's John Monfred. I'm a junior in the college, a frustrated political science major. I think there are a lot of us in here. Um, <laughs> oh, dear. I guess my question is, uh, it's impossible to study politics and not be absolutely infuriated by it. Um, we look at Congress, um, and when we think about our future and how with no offense to Senator Simpson, the old farts in Congress are. Oh, are, Alan! Are, I don't hear, I don't hear it. He's you not didn't a curtain. You miss anything. I, I can't, I Alan didn't hear it. <laughs> yeah. Let's leave it as an idiot. Ask your question, John. No, no, no. Forget me. How, what can we do I to I would say quit while you're ahead, but you're not ahead. So ask your question. 
how does my generation, what can we do to secure our future? We have a Congress that is, is, is not concerned about the environment, run by special interests. What can we do short of marching on Washington? So, Alan, that's a good Well, I heard, he called me an old fart. I <laughs> was a young one. I got out 20 years ago, let me tell you. There haven't been a single word said in here about Social Security. And you and your generation better perk up because you really are suckers. Because I can tell you one thing, the AARP is an absolutely irresponsible group of people bound together by a love of airline discounts and insurance discounts and everything else. And let me tell you, they're out around the country now today. They realize the heat is on them. If anybody's gonna solve Social Security, it ought to be the AARP because the bloodstream of Social Security is the payroll tax and they've taken the damn thing from 6.2 to 4.2, which knocks 140 billion a year out of it. What did they say about that? Yeah. Nothing. I asked their group, are there any patriots in here or just marketers? I'm like, yeah, I get in a lot of trouble, but I tell you, I never lost an election because I didn't do bullshit. Yeah. And that's what people are waiting for now. By doing nothing, in 2036, Social Security will pay out 23% less and no one no one will challenge that figure. It was never a retirement, hadn't had a thing to do with retirement, it was an income supplement. And it was set at 63 life expectancy, that's why they put the retirement at 65. And now it's 78.1. And if we can't even raise the retirement age to 68 by the year 2050, and the ARP said, well, how will people be able to prepare for that? Well. It, I think they'll figure it out. <laughs> I mean, for that God's sake. Real, real quick, that's a, that's a great answer, but real quick, think about running for office, and, and you may laugh, that I can't win. There was a young man at Penn who I got to know because he sat in the Penn cheering section at basketball games dressed as a hot dog. Dressed as a hot dog, he did. He had his, his head and body were encased in a hot dog with mustard down the middle. He goes to Iraq. I think he was in ROTC. Yeah, yeah. He goes to Iraq and he fights in Iraqi freedom. And the next thing I know, I got to know him during the basketball season. The next thing I know, he calls me and he says, I'm here in Harrisburg. I'd like to come see you. I said, sure. He's a member of the legislature. He wins the Republican primary in Delaware County, gets elected because he was an Iraqi freedom vet and he had good ideas gets elected, becomes a, a member of the legislature, was one of only three Republicans to vote for our education budget and help to get it passed mm -hmm. and made a big difference in the lives of children in Pennsylvania. You, people will tell you you can't win, baloney, mm -hmm. baloney. Yeah, baloney. really important. And jo I know John really well, and you all should know, he is, John, if you do as much to get out the vote mm -hmm. of young people, as you've done to get our students to the palestra to basketball games, <laughs> that will make a huge difference. Young no people have to vote. No the numbers count. And that's a worthy cause as well. Great question. Let me, other? There's one over there. One over here? Somewhere over there. Somewhere over there. It's hard to see. It's dark from this perspective. Yes. Introduce yourself. Yes. My, is the mic on? Okay. Hi, my name is Haywood Perry. I'm an undergraduate uh, here at Penn, Urban Studies major. Hi, Haywood. How are you doing, President Gutman? And so, a uh, quick question actually for Mr. Blow. I was, um, your article this weekend on the curious case um, of Trayvon Martin was a searing reminder um, of the role that the justice system plays um, within the question of, is America broken? Um, you said, as the father of two black teenage boys, this case hits close to home. This is the fear that seizes me whenever my boys are out in the world, that a man with a gun and an itchy finger will find them suspicious, that passions may run hot and blood run cold, that it might all end with a hole in their chest and a hole in my heart, that the law might prove insufficient to solve my loss. Could you please speak on the role that our justice system has in the question of, is America broken? Okay. Now this is, you touched the button. Um, so I'm going to be fast. But, but yes, in terms, of, in terms of the justice system, it's absolutely broken. We incarcerate, let's, let's put aside the shooting, because that was, uh, 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 that was a neighborhood watch guy, wasn't police. 
It was a neighborhood watch guy shot an unarmed uh, uh, boy of 17 years old who had some Skittles and an Arizona iced tea. That was his only offense, was walking in the rain with a sweatshirt on. Uh, but the criminal justice system is absolutely broken in America. We incarcerate people uh, at twice the rate of the nearest other developed country. We have a ridiculous war on drugs in this country, which has devolved into a war on black and brown people and possession of marijuana. It's no longer about big drugs. It's no longer about kingpins. It's about whether or not some 16-year-old kid has a joint in his pocket and whether or not we can ruin his life for the rest of his life. And what that means is that everybody has a role to play in that. That is both Democrats and Republicans have contributed to this mess that we're in. We have had this war, war on crime, which you know, I guess we, we all think of as a Republican issue, but when you look at who has financed the, the per, per, perpetuation of the, the drug war, it has largely been Democrats who have wanted to buy a badge of I am also tough on crimes and appease the police unions and be able to stand up when they go to the, that next city or that next state with the police chief and say, I'm on this guy's side. So that when President Obama was running for office in 2008, there's a program called the Burn Grants. Burn Grants basically plays for everybody to go out and, and, and get uh, frisked all the time. So in New York City, we have 600,000 people got frisked, stop and frisked this year. Most of them are black and brown. Most of them are young men. There are only 200 plus thousand young black men in New York. That means that some of those guys are getting stopped four, five times. And then they're getting put into this system because they had a joint in their pocket. And that means they come out not being able to get housing, not being able to get work, not being able to participate in the political system that we're talking about up here, not being able to run for that Senate seat, that local congressional seat that will help him out. That is the problem. Michelle Alexander has written this amazing book. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm running gonna, off. Mary, right, I'm going to stop you, but I. There, I want to put this fact out there. No, there are now fact. more oh. black people in prison than there were in slavery when the year that it was over. That is a problem and a broken system, and we're giving away young people when we do not have young people to give away. China had, if you take the top 20% of China's population, say they're there, those are there. Uh, honor students, then they have more honor students than we have students. We don't have people to store behind bars and say these people are disposable. Everybody, we need them to work and we need them in colleges like you guys to get degrees. That's what we need. It's broken. Thank you. I'm going to take one more question right up front here. This is on. Hi, uh, my name is Gibran Khan. I'm a senior studying business in the Warden School in philosophy. So taking a step back and looking at the political system we have today, you see the immense partisanship going on in Congress leading to this gridlock. You see more Americans than ever before standing independent and completely unaffiliated with political parties. Where do you see the future of politics outside of the Republican and Democrat? political pigeonholes, so to speak. There is a, a thing going on in America called Americans Elect. And watch mm -hmm. out for it. I'm not involved with it, but I know Ed knows, and I'm sure that Mr. Blow knows. And you've heard of it, John. Let me tell you, they are already qualified in 38 states. Mm -hmm. Every time they need to go to the Secretary of State of any state in the Union, they say, how many signatures do we need to get on the ballot? And they'll give them the figure and they go get double that. People are fed up. This thing, I don't know where it's going, but it will send shockwaves through the Democrat and Republican Party. And they will pick, pick, they will have a convention, an internet convention in June or July, and they will pick a Republican or a Democrat for president and the opposite party for a vice president and agree that their cabinet will be half Democrat and half Republican. So they're not out to destroy mm -hmm. parties, but boy, 
son, you want to get aboard, and I'm, I can't be part of it because I've irritated more Democrats and Republicans in the House, and we need their vote on this. We have 47 Republicans ready to go on this Simpson Bowles. We don't call it BS, it's Simpson Bowles, not Bowles Simpson. And we have about 160 House members, both parties equally divided. This thing is being put in legislative language. I know that sounds like inside baseball, but it's not. Because then when the guys say, what is this thing you're doing? You're going to look at it, book page and hymn number, and we'll see where it goes. But very interesting that, as to what's happening with this organization. John, Allen, Peggy, Ed, Charles, we owe you a great debt of gratitude. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Have they come to you to yeah. run? They should, yeah, well, you know. Yeah. They should come to you and Erskine. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. You are a wonderful audience. Thank you.